I was saying welcome. Welcome uh, Studio Insiders and all others too who might be joining us. Um, this is our, of course, our little monthly chat. I just want to remind those who are tuned in but are not yet Studio Insider members that this is our little club we have on YouTube, exclusive to our YouTube channel, where for a small monthly fee of $4.99, um, you can uh, you can ask questions during the live chat and you get every the first Sunday of every month you get a coupon for a free lesson a free video lesson from our website a tutorial website and you also get um, you also get later on in the month a free video clip um, so if you uh, if you're interested, just uh, uh, click the word join. It should be right there somewhere on your screen, below to the side, at the top somewhere. There should be the word join. Okay, now, uh, before we get started with the questions and answers, we have a, a little bit of a, a little clip, a little introduction clip on uh, shadows, uh, the kinds of shadows and that sort of thing. So we're going to play the clip first. It's about seven minutes long. We'll play the clip first. And then we will take questions. Okay? So, here we go. Shadows are areas that do not receive rays from the light source. We can see in this image, the light source is, in such a, is located in such a way that it's being blocked in most areas. We see very little, a little bit right in here, a little bit creeping up right in here, a little bit of backlight right in here 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 well you can see it here but you see that even though this image is very readable very clear a large percentage of the area is in shadow both form shadows and cast shadows uh, are made up of variations of values now we can uh, learn to read those values if we divide them into four areas of shadow four kinds of shadow you might call it four kinds of maybe form and cast shadow. Uh, the occlusion shadow, which is the darkest, that would be this area right in here on this image. These areas right in here where the image is, one image is touching another, being squeezed out. That's going to be the darkest part of uh, any shadow, the occlusion shadow. And let me say that Without it, the image is going to look as if it's floating. So it's important to see and to put that little occlusion shadow in there. Uh, then, beyond the occlusion shadow, uh, we see variations in shadow. And you can see it right here how this shadow, this form shadow, get, is darker. Right here where it joins that little occlusion is darker. And then it begins to get a little lighter and perhaps a little lighter. And it would vary on, uh, that sequence varies on images depending upon the shape and the curvature, uh, the curvature of the flatness, I should say, or uh, how the images are um, shaped within the turns in and turns out, such as we see right in here. So it's important to recognize the degree of dark uh, that we're seeing on the shadows as they gradate. Now that we've examined the major characteristics of, co of shadows' values, um, let's also examine the behavior of shadow colors. One thing that we can expect to happen in shadow colors is that local colors do not appear in shadows. Now let's do a little analysis of this uh, farmhouse sitting in a pasture and show you what I'm talking about. We'll bring out the color reader. We'll just put it right here. And first let's read the local color. What we see is the local color of the yellow in that house. So there we have it. Uh, our, from our viewpoint we can see the way the light is hitting the house. This is how we read the local color. So we'll just pull the color reader down a bit there and give you just a little bit of a sampling of that local color right here so we can isolate it and let you see clearly what's going on here. Now remember I said we will not see local color in shadows. 
what we can expect from shadows is that the behavior of color is going to change. Now, how that change happens might vary according to the light, according to the atmosphere, according to the kind of shadow. So let's see how the behavior uh, changes here. Now, on the shadow side of the house, you can clearly see there's a change in color. It's not the same color, or not the same kind of color. I'm talking color now, hue, value, and intensity or saturation. That's what we mean when we say color. We mean all three of those things, not just one. So let's see. So we'll sample right here. And you can already see that is quite different from this. And yet it looks right when we see the two together in this environment. Let's make a little splotch of that now and kind of see what, what kind of comparison we have. There it is right there. Well, let's examine one more and give you just a, an idea of what you can expect to see. This is not to establish rules. No, don't do that. You establish rules, you're going to limit yourself. But what can you expect to see? So let's use the sampler in the grass area, right down in here. Now we can see there are little shallow shadows. There's probably areas there uh, that are a little bit deeper or perhaps the grass in front a little taller. So we'll get right in here and sample right there. That is pretty much in this particular photo. It would be different if we were there on location. I'm so sorry we can't be because then we could really read what's going on. But in this photo, this particular photo, the local color of this grass is this. So we'll make a sampling right up here so that we can compare what's going on there. All right, there we go. Hue, value, and intensity. Yellow, green, middle value, um, kind of low in intensity, as you can see right here. And we can expect that in nature. All right, now let's sample the let's sample the actual shadow area and watch what happens in greens for the most part you you can expect to see that this time not only did the intent the intensity stayed pretty much the same not only did the value change but the hue changed the hue changed now you can see it's very very dark here as it would be in a cast shadow but if we move our little reader back up here so we can see a lighter version of that hue. This didn't change, you see. So this is the same intensity and same hue. Then let's see what happened. Let's put them side by side and we can see the comparison of a hue change. You see that's more in the blue-green. More blue-green here and more yellow-green here. So we can expect those kinds of changes and perhaps uh, n not all together. Sometimes we get a hue change and an intensity change, depending on the subject, depending on the light, depending on lots of things. But you, it, we're always going to get a value change. But we can expect that behavior in shadow to change that color. And now it's time for your questions. Okay, so we'll take questions now and get this discussion started. Um, We'll start with uh, G. Peachy, who uh, asked the question, I think, before we, uh, before we started the clip. Do shadows normally produce hard or soft edges, and when to know which to use? Shadows are going to show uh, three ways, either as, uh, well, the, the cast shadows are going to show both hard and ver very, uh, a varying degree of from hard to soft, the best way to know what to do is to observe what the shadow is doing. Now here I go again, always, rather than make rules about things, it's always better to observe what the thing is doing. Observe for yourself. Uh, we could make rules about it, but that rule might not apply to the next thing that you do that has shadows in it. Now, remembering the difference of that we have those two major categories of shadows. The cast shadow, which is caused by light being blocked. And we have the form shadow, which is the shadow that's on a surface or on a form itself. So uh, on a form shadow, if the form shadow is uh, a rounded form, it's going to be gradated. 
rather than having a distinct edge there, the shadow is more or less going to be gradated. If it's a flatter surface, uh, we probably won't see, we'll see some, maybe some value differences, but we won't see necessarily edges except unless it's a cast shadow on the surface. So we need to observe these things and uh, observe the characteristic of it so then we'll know what to do. Um, okay, let's see. Can you talk a little bit about creating indoor shadows from lamps and overhead lights? Okay. Uh, the shadow is determined, of course, by the light source. The, way, the better way to talk about that is the strength of the light. The softer light sources are going to give us um, softer shadows. Maybe that's a good way to say it. If the light source is a direct light source, we'll get a more distinct shadow. If the light source is diffused, such as overhead light, uh, if it's an overhead light that is, uh, has a, sh um, um, a, 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 what do you call it, shield, what is it? diffuser, diffuser over it, it's going to disperse the light rays, so the light rays will not be, will not be coming directly down on the surfaces, but they'll be dispersed in many different directions. And so the shadows then won't be as evident. They'll be softer and they'll be opposite where opposite of, opposite of wherever that light source is. So you can always look for the shadow uh, opposite pretty much the light source. Um, that is the, from lamps or overhead lights, that's pretty, study that. Study that. Take a simple uh, image, maybe uh, maybe a book or a lamp or a mug or something like that, and place it so that there's a lamp light uh, shining onto it. And watch what the shadow is doing from that lamp light. If it's a cast shadow, uh, watch the, how the cast shadow is formed, and also watch the form shadow. Look at the form shadow then place that same image under an overhead light that's diffused and, and then look at the difference between how you see those shadows, how indistinct and soft they are under that diffused light uh, as opposed to the direct light. Um, okay, Cheryl, uh, discuss the shape of shadows. A shadow doesn't always take the shape of it. Ah, I know what you mean. You missed one. Oh, I missed one? Bridget. Okay, I'll go back to Bridget. Hold it right there. Let me answer Cheryl since I got started on it. Shape of shadow doesn't always, that's right. You're talking about the cast shadow now. Yeah. Um, yeah when, if you're, when you're uh, forming a cast shadow, you might think because the shadow is cast by the image that it's going to form the shape of that image. And if you're thinking that, rather than observing the shape of the cast shadow, you might miss the shape of the shadow itself. Many, many times that shape of that cast shadow will look nothing like the image that's casting the shadow. It depends upon, a lot depends, the shape of it's going to depend upon where the light is located. Is the light located low down? Uh, if you're thinking of outside, is the light located low down in the sky? If it is, it's gonna make a, a longer cast shadow. And um, if, if it's like tilted about a, uh, another degree up, another degree or two up into the sky, it casts a shorter shadow. But all that shape is showing, is showing more or less the light's view of the shadow, which is not going to be the same shape. So rather than even think, look at the shape of that shadow as a unique shape within itself, where you're examining the direction of the edges, uh, how the shapes are, uh, if they're if they're curved, in which direction they're curved, and that sort of thing. So, so always study the shape of a cast shadow as its own unique shape, rather than trying to make it a shape of whatever's causing the the shadow. Um, as I go back to Bridget, there, uh, can you talk a little bit about creating? Oh, that was, I did answer that one. Oh. Yeah, I just answered it. Here's this one. Uh huh. And the other, talk about representing occlusion shadows. Okay, that one. An occlusion shadow 
um, is a shuttle that, where all the light is uh, is uh, gone, where all the, there is no light. And a, a typical example of occlusion shadow, you can create one right here if you just put one finger on top of the other and you look at that little tiny dark area but where your fingers are, where your your fingers are touching, that's an occlusion shadow. And uh, if, if you look around you, anything that's sitting on a surface is creating an occlusion shadow. It's that dark, 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 and sometimes, it, it, most times, many times, I'm not going to say most, many, or whatever, but you can expect it to be a, a very thin, thin little dark area. But it's necessary because without it, images will often appear to be floating rather than sitting on the surface. So uh, it is the occlusion shadow is the darkest shadow you will see, and now there is some debate. Like if you're looking down a tunnel, uh, if you're looking down a tunnel and it's closed, uh, is that occlusion? Yes, it could be called occlusion, where the light rays can't hit it, where it's absolutely the light is absolutely shut away from it. Then that's that would be occlusion. Okay, um, Martha. Can you talk about the angle angles of long shadows as you have in the photo behind you with the long shadows in the evening and early morning and how do you determine the angles other than by observation? You can't determine anything other than by observation if you're, if you're an artist. Well, you can make theories about it, but the theories are not always going to ring true. You have to observe. Now, you can predict uh, by predicting an angle, you can predict. If if you know, if you find the angle at which the sun is located, and let's see if I'm sure I'm staying in the camera here. If you predict the angle at which the, at, at which the sun is located, then you can predict that those sun rays are coming down at that angle between you and the light. Between you, not anything around you, but between where you are, it's the way you're seeing it because if you're seeing the light at this angle, like this, if, if, the, if the light's straight ahead there and those rays are coming straight towards me, I can move over here and those lights are going to come at an angle. So where you are determines the angle you see, uh, at which you see those rays. Now, the angles of the shadows are going to follow the same rule. The shadows are created by the light rays or by, shadows are created by, um, uh, things blocking the light rays, the light rays being blocked. Now, wait a minute, let's see, there was something else there. Oh, the, the picture behind me. Now, yeah, if you look at the picture behind me, <clears throat> uh, you can see that, uh, you can see that, look at each, look, look at, just focus on any tree. If you focus on that tree that's in the center there, you'll see that the angle of that shadow is coming straight towards you. That's a straight line. And you can see the sun straight above it. You see the location of the light straight above it, right behind that tree, is causing that angle uh, to be straight towards you. Now look at the tree on the right. You can see the tree on the right. Let me move out of the way a little bit more here. I just move way over here. You can see the, the tree on the right of the sun. Well, now you see the shadow is being cast to the right of that tree. The shadow that connects to that tree. <clears throat> the tree that we see the uh, uh, which the, the tree that we see the largest the ones that we see not the one closest closest to us but uh, about uh, two thirds of the way back that tree on the right now you and so uh, you see the the shadow the cast shadow connects to that tree and you see it is um, coming towards us at a, at a right angle if you look at that angle if you align your uh, align your finger with that angle you'll see that it's, what is it, about 4 o'clock, about a 4 o'clock angle. And then if you go on the other side, let me move over like this, you go on the other side, look at this, see that big tree's right there on the left? It's on the left-hand side of the sun. And you see how that angle is angled towards the left, towards your left? So you can see there, and that's also a, a good example of a one-point perspective, uh, the way that, that light, uh, if you look at those shadows, if you follow those lines all the way back, continue to follow those lines of the cast shadow, those angles of the cast shadows, if you follow those all the way back, they will connect. 
back somewhere in the distance because uh, the angle of the light uh, is going wherever the sun, wherever you are in relationship to the sun is going to determine uh, the angle at which the shadow is cast. And you, it's the vertical things that are going to cast those shadows, by the way. Um, well, anything, it has to have height before it can cast a shadow. So maybe I made that clear. Don't know if it did. Never know. <clears throat> kind of hope. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, can I combine three value, a three-value pattern with no 10 when I want to translate shadow? In no 10, we're not, uh, um, wait a minute. In no 10, all right, uh, there's, it could be, my, the, the way I prefer thinking of no 10 is as all shadow in the dark area. I know there are those that will make a three value no 10. Um, that is really not a true no 10. That is a three value study. So in a two value, in a no 10 where just just the dark of the no tan represents the pattern of all shadow that you see. Uh, of course, the um, you of course you will be translating all the shadows within that value because that part of the no tan, the dark part of the no tan, means shadow. That's how we use it. It means shadow. So whatever is in that dark pattern is going to be translated in some value of shadow values. Maybe I made that clear, I don't know. Okay, uh, discuss how we can decide when shadow is warm or cool, outside or inside. Okay. <clears throat> um, this is not definitive, but here's what you can look for. If you look for the color or the temperature of the light source, now, here's what you can look look for that will most likely happen. Now, there, there are exceptions, like when we have colors that are reflecting lights in the shadows and stuff like that. But let's just assume that without colors surrounding an area that might be reflecting uh, the color itself into a shadow, if the light source is warm, now think about it. If the light source is warm, the warm light rays are hitting where anything that happens to be in the line of those light rays. What is not hit, what is not being hit by those light rays then will be cooler because that warm light ray is not hitting that. So we can look for it to be cooler if the light source is warm. And the reverse is true that if the light source is cool, it's cool light rays. Even if light rays, usually if the light source is cool, it's outside, it's the overcast light. Inside it might be a, an LED light, it might be a fluorescent light. Still, if the temperature of that light source is cool, where, wherever those rays of that light are hitting, it's cooler. And where the rays cannot hit, therefore, it's going to be warmer. So looking or detecting the temperature of your light source is going to help you also detect the temperature of the shadows that you're observing in that light source. Um, okay, what's next? Um, is it further? Is it Melissa? Sophia? 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 Uh, please discuss how you can... Oh, that was it. That's what it just answered. Okay, so uh, Melissa's next. Should you expect a shadow to be both a darker value and a lower intensity compared to local color? <clears throat> You're going to always expect it to be a darker value. You can expect it to be a lower, a lower intensity. Perhaps it's a little more difficult to see. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's pollen season here. And um, there are frogs that insist upon getting in my throat. <laughs> so we just have to put up with that. Anyway, um, the intensity and the darker value. All right, we can always count on a shadow being darker. That's part of the nature of shadow. Because the 
because the light has deprived that area of uh, a full illumination, the hue most likely is going to be less intense. Now, look for it. Look for it. Um, in, in an area where there are lots of neutrals, for example, tree trunks normally are very neutral in color, that's more difficult to observe. So the degree to which it is going to be a lower intensity has a lot to do with the saturation or the, sat the degree of saturation of the hue of the thing. Um, I hope I made that clear. I wish I <laughs> wish, wish you folks could talk back to me uh, with your voices so I would know if I answer these things, but we'll take it as we, as we go and see how it works out. Uh, if you're trying to, Bridget, if you're trying to warm up a shadow, do you use yellow? If so, how do you choose which one? Not necessarily. Any of the warm colors can warm a shadow. So uh, first you determine if you're, if you're, if the shadow is being, wherever the shadow is being cast, what is the local hue of that shadow? And, but if you want to warm it, um, find the hue, the hue that's closest to it and warm with a, with that hue. Now, oh, no, no, let me say that different. Find a color, a color. The color means whatever's coming out of the tube that is closest to it, uh, closest to whatever the local color is and warm with that hue. So you could be, you could warm with a red, you could warm with a red orange, with an orange, with a yellow orange, with a yellow. You could even warm with a yellow green if you're warming a cooler color. And you could even warm, you really could warm with a red violet if you're warming, if, if the local hue, local color is, uh, is violet, for example, then you could warm with a red violet. So you make those choices based on whatever the, the local color is. All right, what's next? Have we run out of questions? Yeah. Oh, we can't run out of questions. No, we can't run out of questions. Um, one thing I want to emphasize here too while we're while we're waiting for more questions to come through, did we did we lose connection or something? No, no, we didn't lose connection. We've just run out of questions. <laughs> One thing that I want to emphasize here is that uh, this discussion uh, we're discussing observation. We're, we're discussing what we can look for. Uh, in other words, if you you might have noticed that uh, you might have noticed that a lot of what I teach is not about your actual painting, but it's about how you prepare yourself to paint. And that's what this is about. Now, one thing I want to emphasize is that when we are studying what's in front of our eyes, we are translating and we're trying to observe what's there and we're trying to translate what's there as a way of informing ourselves for discovering how that works. But then we can go beyond that and we can, we can paint with interpretation, which a lot of painters end up doing. So we observe something and then we ask the question, well, what if? Uh, what if I make a shadow in blue rather than in the, maybe the, uh, the red violet that I'm seeing in it or something like that. So there is interpretation, but in order to, in order to, um, know how to make decisions about interpreting or even creating, it's a good idea to study ahead of time to actually find out how things work through study. And that makes us better able, freer in fact, to know what the options are when we want to make interpretations. Okay, um, isn't that, is that Phil McNally? Phil McNally. Mm -hmm. I noticed the surface uh, I notice the surface the shadow is projected on is change cha on changes the color of the object. It's projecting it. This is surface. The surface. 
Anakin, I'm not reading that right. I notice the surface, the shadow is projected on. Yeah, we'll change it. We'll change the color. Yes. Yeah. The surface of the shadow is projected on. Uh, it, e it's on the green grass or it's on the brown tree? Or yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the color, yes, whatever color, uh, whatever color that shadow is on um, is going to it's going to change. You could have three objects. You could have uh, three different colors li aligned side by side. If you had like a a painted floor, <laughs> now that's stupid. Uh, <laughs> if you uh, the barn is, that's, is that a good example? No, that's not not a good example because it's all the same color. Um, oh yeah, well okay. So you have the same shot. You have the same. I've got this picture of the barn here. You've got. Uh, You've got the same light shining on the barn as you have shining on the trees, but the the color of the shadow on the barn is a different color from the color of the shadow in the trees. I don't know if that's what he don't know if that's what you were talking about, or um, but perhaps if it is not, give me give me another hit on that one and let's let's see if I can do a better job. Okay, uh, Cheryl is next. Um, will a cast shadow contain colors of the surface? Yeah. Um, will the cast shadow contain colors of the surface? That's the same question. It is cast upon, yes. Uh, yes, um, the color it's cast upon is going to influence it. Um, the the house I showed you there the the, the uh, in the video clip we did green is the grass uh, whatever that uh, you know I could pick a blade of that grass and bring it in here and we could hold it up we'd all be looking at the same green like that pretty much I mean under the same light and so on but when all those grass blades are put together and then they're in this situation of light shining on them and uh, shadows being cast upon them. Um, it's the green is underneath there. It becomes a part of the mix. But uh, other colors that enter into it are determined by um, well, it's determined by the what color the light source is. Um, determined by the degree of the of the light source and a number of other things. But yes, you can pretty much count on the local hue or the hue, the the mother color you might call it of the surface being a part of us mixtures, but many times you can also look for that changing from like we saw in the example I showed you there from yellow green to blue green that the kind of change we saw we saw a similar kind of change in the in the yellow house there so um, it it does influence it but look for a change um, okay Hey, Dane, this is Phil. Hey, Phil. <laughs> uh, uh, are shadows just, Melissa, are, shadow, are cast shadows just darker than form shadows, or there, is there more to consider? We, we couldn't make rules about that because a cast shadow might not necessarily. Cast shadows, um, cast shadows sometimes can, be, can gradate out to be lighter than the form shadow. Uh, and there again, it depends upon how close the light is to it, how strong the light is, and that sort of thing. Best thing, I'm going to go back and say it again. Everybody gets tired of me saying it, but I'm going to keep saying it. Observe it. <laughs> Observe it. We can't make rules like that. Uh, because every time we make rules, then we blind ourselves to seeing what's there. We'll be looking for the rule, and if we don't see the rule, we'll make it look like the rule, and then we will miss out on the whole ball game. So, uh, okay. Next, um, is it ever a Bridget? I, if I, I forget sometimes to call your names for your questions. I, I apologize for that, but you just have to deal with it because that's just me. Uh, Bridget, is it ever appropriate to use black in a shadow color? Appropriate. I can't make a rule about that. Okay, so if we use black to... Uh, if we use black to change the color, 
then yes, but using black just to darken is not always the answer. In, in fact, most of the time it's not the answer. Uh, but for example, the um, reason I'm hesitating about this is because I know some excellent examples. For example, ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, or uh, cobalt blue, I would say maybe, no, maybe some of you know, ultramarine blue is a good example. That something that might be a deep hue of ultramarine blue, adding a little black into ultramarine blue, will, where we st allow the blue to still come through, can serve as a color enhancer or a color moder uh, modifier, you might say, rather than a, just a value modifier. Same thing is true with the lizard and crimson. A black mixed with lizard and crimson makes a beautiful, uh, a beautiful shadow color. Even can make a, a beautiful, well, can make a beautiful color if that's what you're trying to go after. Other colors, viridian, phthalo blue, phthalo green. I can think of a number of those that we can add black to. Well, in fact, you can add black to any color and you're going to change the character of the color. But it might, I would say before, before reaching for black, Consider the alternative. Go for the complement first, because the shadow, uh, uh, the shadows, have a, a lean towards their complementary color. So go for that complement first. I go for something that is in the complementary range before reaching for black. So I think maybe uh, that would be a better way to handle that. Feel again. Feel. Uh, let's talk about a leaf that's, that the sun is shining through. Aha! Good idea. The shadow color is part green and part whatever that shadow is cast upon it. Right. The, line, the, the sun shining through it creates that translucence. Uh, but then if there's a cast shadow, like if there's a leaf, uh, say, between, I said, okay, so my, my hand here is the, is the leaf. The sun is out there where you are. So that sun's coming through my leaf here, and I'm seeing it on this side, and I'm seeing that translucence of the leaf. All right, so there's another leaf right here that's casting a shadow on that leaf. And so when it casts that shadow on that leaf, it takes away the translucence. I don't see that translucence anymore. What I see is whatever color, meaning whatever hue, whatever value, whatever intensity, um, that cast shadow has caused on that leaf and the degree the distance of this leaf casting the shadow here is going to determine that because the closer I am to it the more light rays I shut out causing that cast shadow to be sharper and denser and the further that leaf is from this leaf <laughs> uh, then the more light rays can bounce in the more 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 uh, ambient light can bounce in there and cause that change. Something happened over here. Oops. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Ron, shadows in photos look very dark. It, 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 is it a good idea to lighten up those dark shadows? It's a good idea to not only lighten them, but to change their, to change their color. Now, here we get into that rough place where it's difficult to make rules. We know that we know a camera, unless you pay zillions of dollars for a camera, a camera is not going to photograph the shadows or the areas in light. It's not going to photograph it as your eyes are seeing it. That it's going to overexpose. If there's lots of light coming through, the camera is going to overexpose those shadows. Uh, it's a good idea to to study what actually happens to those shadows. Now, if there's lots of texture in that shadow, it's not just a matter of darkening, but it's a matter of also uh, deciding what color range you're seeing those changes take place. Um, let's see if I can give you an example of this. If you can imagine a photograph of, uh, oh, I know, I know a good, a good, a good example. A good example might be what I've got right in front of me right here, a, a picture of a rose. Those of you who've taken my workshops have seen this one a few times. Okay, so we can tell that this is very dark. This is darker than we probably see it if we were there. <clears throat> so where, where the shadow is at the edge there, we would know 
that that needs that would need to be a little bit more not just darker but a little bit redder and we know that it would need to gradate out into a darker dark i don't know if i answered that run uh but the thing to do is to is to study what happens in in shadows and the various things and you can you can go outside and study that and you'll be able to make those decisions that within the shadow areas you're going to see several degrees several values but those values are going to also change in color with the more ambient light they're receiving. And so uh, maybe that's the most, maybe, maybe that's the best in, in, in a general answer that I can give there. Joni, do you determine the degree of shadow darkness or lightness by contrasting it with the light shape beside it or other shadows or both? Uh, First, by the light that's beside it, it's going to be relative to the other shadows. So I think the degree of light beside it, it, here's an example of that. Of course, this is another one of those photos, so we're not going to really see clearly. Uh, let's see this kitten. You see this kitten. All right, you can see that the degree of shadow right here, we can see, we can see, compare the light, the, 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 the contrast, the degree of contrast with the light beside it. But then if you look at, at this shadow compared to the shadow under the kitten's chin, there would be, you're comparing, one, the, you're comparing the degree of value of one shadow to the other. So I think you could say you need to look for both. Okay, Phil, let's go back to the leaf. <laughs> If the leaf is casting a shadow against red brick, then the shadow color on the brick will be part green and darker red. Not necessarily part green. It depends. If the leaf is casting a shadow on a red brick, then the, the color of the shadow is going to be determined by the color of the brick. If the leaf is close enough that some of its light some of its color reflects back into that brick, then yes. But if the leaf is far enough away from the brick so that its color is not going to reflect back into it, then the shadow is determined by the color of the brick. Now, here's the thing. Remember that reflected light and reflected color is very weak light rays. You can think uh, light ray, the, 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 the strength of light rays is going to determine the strength of the shadow. The, the, uh, Yes, I guess pretty much said that. All right, look, we have a we will have a primary light source. If we're thinking outside, we know that's the sun. Now, on a sunny day, we have a primary light source. We have a secondary light source, which is going to be the, which is the sky. Now, then we'll have tertiary light sources, uh, which will be what we call ambient light or bounce light, and those are the sources that bounce light back on to each other. They just bounce all over the place. The primary light source, the strength of the primary light source can overpower the other two. So sometimes uh, you might see, if the light source is so strong, you might not see the blue light reflecting on a tin roof, for example, or metal roof. At other times when the light is not quite so strong, primary light source, then you will see more of the secondary light source. So the strength of the light, light beams can overpower and if the strength of light, be, and so therefore, therefore, the if the if an image if one image is close enough to an, uh, another because of the strength of the light beams being the character of that, then some of that color may reflect back into it. But if the image is further away, then there's not enough strength of that ambient light, not enough strength of those those rays coming bouncing off that color to bounce back into it so maybe maybe that answered without getting it too confusing all right Bridget this is probably no though there's no silly question don't worry about that so I'll just skip that part uh, instead of painting the shadow separately can you add shadow on top of your painting with glazing well that's about that's a technical question <clears throat> That's a technical question, and it could be done either way. It uh, depends on the it depends upon the technique you're using, the painting technique you're using, whether you're using 
a more direct technique or more indirect technique of whether you're using uh, <clears throat> you, you're using the the layered where you paint one layer let it dry another layer let it dry that sort of thing that's the original uh, traditional classical method of painting or whether you're painting more uh, more direct where uh, almost like a la prima where you're forming shadows and lights as you go all of that determines on what the painting is called for what it's calling for so uh, no it's not silly at all and okay I hope I answered that and the next one um, how do you that is Kachana, Kachana? I hope I didn't. Um, Kanchana, yeah. Kanchana, Kanchana. I'm I'm not good at pronouncing names. I'm not familiar with. So <laughs> forgive me if I if I murdered your name there. Uh, I think the word is butcher, not murder. Murder, isn't it? But don't they mean the same thing? Anyway, uh, how do you determine by shadows? No, no. How do you determine by shadows that a photograph is taken in the morning and late afternoon? You can't always. You can't always. You don't know. Uh, I know there are people that say, yes, you can tell, but I, I argue with it. I take issue with it because I've tried many times and I can't do it. And even uh, by photograph, if you don't know when the photograph was taken, if it's a photograph you were just handed or you'd got somewhere else and you don't know, there's really no way of telling whether it's, uh, whether it's taken in the morning or the evening by the shadows. You can't really. Some people say well, the shadows are warmer at one time than they are another. I say there's just no way of telling. There's no, you will do other things in your painting. Uh, well, you know, if you see a sunset, you said painting of a sunset, it may be a sunrise. We call them sunsets because that's sort of the romantic thing to do, isn't it? But it could be sunrise. And unless the artist tells you the title of the painting, uh, what it is, um, there is no way that I know of to tell. Okay. Um, <clears throat> are these chats? Oh, well, let me answer Joni's question. These chats record. I it. Oh, you answered it. Good. All right. Can <clears throat> channel. Anyway, do metals have different shadow colors than non metal shadow? It depends on the color of the metal. Uh, you can't make rules like that. You really just can't make rules like that. <laughs> there again, it comes down to observation. I know we've been taught, haven't we been taught to paint by rules? You can look for this, look for this, look for this. always do this, always do that. Bull, use your observation. <laughs> use your observation. Uh, so no, it depends. I'm just being a smart aleck now, which is one of my favorite things to do. But uh, you, you use your observation. You, you really just can't make rules about that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what was the next there? Uh, uh, Port she's used to yeah, Melissa, but, uh, you're used to your name uh -huh, being butchered. <laughs> Poor baby. Anyway, Melissa, form and cast shadows have different causes, but do you treat them differently when you paint them? Treat them differently. <clears throat> well, I'm not sure I understand uh, what you mean when you say treat them differently. You use the same approach to painting. You, in form shadow, uh, if the if the form is rounded, then you're gonna have you're gonna have a gradation there. Uh, if the form is flat, like a build, the wall of a building, it's not going to be gradated. But the uh, if it's a shadow side of the building, there will be some gradation there because it's not going to be the same darkness, uh, depending on the ambient light that's reflecting back into it. And also wherever the sun is, there'll be some gradation there. Uh, as far as how you handle them, it, it, I don't see that they would, you might say that they'd be treated differently. Um, it's the same observation same kind of observation, uh, same technique that you would use. So it's just a matter, are you going to be gradating or uh, are you going to be gradating or to the degree you're going to be gradating? And, and uh, usually in the form shadows, I think I said earlier, you're not, you're going to see in the form shadow, you won't see an edge, you'll see a continuation, a gradation 
around a rounded form. Now cast shadow, you're going to see some gradation, and you're going to see probably edges. Uh, you will see edges in the cast shadow, and they will vary in degree of uh, softness. Uh, sometimes they will even gradate out into uh, into maybe a, a, a more shallow shadow or a low light. So uh, I hope I answered that. That's about the best I can do with that one, uh, Melissa. Okay, do you have another one? Are we running out of questions? We're almost run out of time, too. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, one minute. Okay, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so let me remind you all that uh, if we have those now that have, might have joined us uh, who are not members, that you can become a member by just clicking on join. Uh, whenever you're watching a video, watching one of the quick tips or any of our, our video less, uh, videos on YouTube, this is a YouTube, unique to YouTube, has nothing to do with the workshops, has nothing to do with the uh, the website where you have all, where we have all of our lessons and everything. It's unique to YouTube. And uh, so anytime you're watching one of the quick tips, you will you should see somewhere around the uh, the video you should see the word join for a membership and you click on that if you you have to have a YouTube app if you've got an iPhone or one of those i i uh, Apple devices I understand um, but anyway uh, join 499 per month you get a, a coupon for a free video lesson every month that you're a member and you get a, a free little uh, um, snippet from one of the lessons and what else you oh you get the ability to ask questions in these chats Joni says how easy is it to make a non-existent shadow for your painting <laughs> well Joni it could be relatively easy as long as you have a good if you have a, an indication of light source if uh, you can you can create shadows one of the favorite is exercises I like to give <clears throat> is to take a light source from one subject and take another subject that has a different light source but use the light source from the first subject uh, to create a study. Uh, you know, I've done that with, with one of the workshops that we did. So what, if you, if, what you look for is the direction of the light source. Remember, it's the light source that creates those shadows. They don't just pop up by themselves. They gotta have a light source of some sort, sort, or they're gonna be occlusion. They're gonna be black, nothing there. So the light source, uh, the location and angle of that light source is going to determine where the shadows are. So if you just are able to imagine where you want your light source you, in anything, you can make up a thing. It doesn't make any difference. But if you can imagine where your light source, is it here, is it here, is it up there, is it behind you? Could very well be behind you, could be directly in front of you, which would create a backlight through almost everything in the shower. And then if the light source is a direct light, it's going to throw cast shadows. And, uh, and you can determine the angles of those cast shadows by the location of the light source directly in front of you. Those cast shadows are going to do something like this. The one directly in front of you is going to come like this. The size, like that. I mean, you can just look for that kind of stuff, uh, like we see in the in the picture behind me, um, and uh, the form shadows, uh, form shadows, the ones facing light rays, the one catching light rays are not shadow. The ones not catching light rays will receive shadow. The degree to which they are casting light rays will determine: are they shallow shadows, or are they just moderate, or, or are they deep? Or the are the occlusion. So, are we ready to go? Shout out to Kay, Lord. Huh? A, a shout out to Kay. Yay! Does that mean she just joined? Uh, she did a chat, super chat. Oh, super chat! Woohoo! Great. Okay, we're out of time, aren't we? Uh, we got a few minutes. Well, how many? My watch, my watch says out of time. <laughs> well, we started a little late. Oh, we started a little late. Well, well, we couldn't help that starting a little late. Okay, one last chance for questions. One more, one last chance. Questions from uh, anybody? Have I thoroughly confused you, or have I enlightened you somewhat? 
All right, let's just close. Go ahead and close out. I believe everybody is either saturated, tired, or something else. <laughs> we don't know which. Okay, um, don't forget to uh, check for your for our quick tips coming out every Wednesday. Uh, if you don't have anything else to do, go give a, a visit to the website and look at what we have there. Uh, we have a new workshop coming up on April the 14th, and this one's going to be on creating emphasis. Emphasis. Uh, how do you use your focal point and how to keep the eye moving from the focal point to other places in the painting and how do you prevent the eye from going places you don't want it to be. Just a fun little exercise there. So yes, uh, Bridget says thank you, you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome to all of you. And uh, we'll see you next time.